I'm very proud of that too because it shows the endurance that I was able to have throughout my career. 2056 games to be exact. Add that to the fact that Carter spent the majority of the 80s anchoring the batting order in both Montreal and New York. The ups and downs of catching never slowed down his run production. Here you are and maybe you've got a foul tip and you come up in a game winning situation and all of a sudden you're asked to drive in that winning run and uh, you're still hurting from the foul tip or uh, the collision at home plate that you just had. So you got to kind of block that out and you just throw your shin guards and your chest protector and your gear off to the side and you grab a bat and you got to say, okay, now my job is to try and drive this run in. Any catcher uh, would tell you that uh, uh, they were in awe of what Gary Carter did on us because of the demands of the position, uh, not only physically, but handling a pitching staff. And being the go-between between, between the manager and the players on the field, all the uh, the other responsibilities that you're expected to handle as a catcher, and then still be an offensive player. He has that tough end. The up and down, I've had nine knee surgeries, and I know what it's like uh, to be in that squat position. And uh, you really have to prepare yourself every year, not only mentally, but uh, physically. Through the wear and tear, the 11-time All-Star and two-time all-Star Game MVP managed to hit 324 career home runs and drive in over 1,200. As chairman of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, it's my pleasure, Gary, to welcome you into the Baseball Hall of Fame family. Edmund Carter, kid, Montreal, National League, 1974 to 1984, 1992. New York National League, 1985 to 1989. San Francisco National League, 1990. Los Angeles National League, 1991. An exuberant on-field general with a signature smile who is known for clutch hitting, and rock-solid defense over 19 years. His tireless work ethic and durability led to the all-time record for total chances by a catcher and National League record for games, caught, putouts, and years leading the league in putouts. An 11-time All-Star, twice the game MVP, earned three Gold Glove Awards and hit 324 home runs, a catalyst for the Expo's first postseason berth in 1981 and a key to the Mets' 1986 World Championship. Welcome to Cooper's Club. Jane and thank you bud. You know that feeling as a kid when you go into a candy store for the first time. All you can do is smile and just stand in awe. Well this kid is in the candy store today. Cooperstown.
where all dreams come true. Can you feel it? It is so sweet. There are so many people to thank today that have influenced my life and my career. I've been told by the other Hall of Famers that I have a time limit, 20, limit, 20 minutes. Those of you that know me, this is going to be difficult. All right? I have a tendency to elaborate at times, so I'm going to try to do my best. Just bear with me. I would be remiss if I did not say a few words in French. So here it goes. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, monsieur president et invité distingué. Il me fait grand plaisir, grand honneur d'être ici midi. J'aimerais remercier toutes les partisans, les clubs des Expos, Mets, Giants, and Dodgers. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. I would uh, like to thank all the sports writers, obviously, for this tremendous honor. I would also like to congratulate Hal McCoy for his great journalism through the years, all the pleasant times coming into the clubhouse, and to Bob Euchre for all the fantastic years of broadcasting. Now, Euchre, you'll never be in the cheap seats again, pal, because you'll always be in the front row. <laughs> I am so humbled to stand before you all and be in the presence of all these great Hall of Famers. This has been a terrific weekend, and I would like to thank all the people involved with the Hall of Fame, from Dale Petrosky to Jane Clark to Jeff Idelson to Kim Bennett, and of course all of the other staff members. I had a dream as a young boy, like all these Hall of Famers up here, to be a professional athlete. I was blessed with a gift, and I thank the Lord above for the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to have played this great game of baseball. I played all the sports as a young boy, but it was always baseball that I loved the most. I collected baseball cards as a hobby and one day dream of what it would be like to have my picture on one of those cards. I grew up in Southern California, a Dodgers fan, and my idol was the Mick, Mickey Mantle. I know you're here with us today, Mick, so thank you for instilling in me the love of the game. You see, I always have been a fan of the game first and a ball player second. Maybe that's why I had the love and passion for this great game so much. My dream became a reality in 1972 when the Montreal Expos drafted me in the third round. In high school, my main sport was football as an All-American quarterback. Most of my scholarship offers from colleges were for football, not for baseball. So I had to think and pray hard and long to help make my decision. My decision was altered after a serious knee injury which resulted in sitting out my entire senior football season. After surgery and rehab, I played the basketball season, but I was looking so forward to playing my passion, baseball. It's funny because my primary positions in high school were as a pitcher and an infielder. During those five, uh, I only caught five or six games my senior year of high school. But during those five or six games, a scout by the name of Bob Zuck, who is here with us today, believed I could become a big league catcher someday. He held true to his word, and on the night of the draft, at 18 years of age, I signed a contract with the Expos and started my, making plans to head off to Jamestown, New York. Bob, thanks for believing in me. So off I went to New York for a two-week tryout camp to determine where I was going to play that year. And it was there that Bill McKenzie, my first catching coach, who taught me all the fundamentals and techniques about catching. He was the one who taught me how to catch. Thanks, Bill, for your motivation and discipline. I don't know if you're here today, but I just want to thank you for everything that you did for me. And it was there in Jamestown, New York, where the journey began. 
I would like to thank all the coaches and managers I played for, from my very first manager, Pat Doherty, to my very last manager, Felipe Alou, in Montreal. However, there is one manager who's left such an impact on my life and in my career, and that was Carl Keel, who was with us today. He managed me when I was in the Instructional League, AA and AAA, and I know he believed in me more than anyone else. I remember he would throw tennis balls to me, and worked on my hitting, and to get out of the way of pitches, and he would even charge me 25 cents for every ball that I would drop while I was catching in a game. This, of course, helped me to concentrate better and helped me focus, and truly, I dropped a lot of balls when I was, uh, was playing in the minor leagues, so this really did help. Although at the end of the year, Carl said, ah, oh, you don't owe me anything. <laughs> Carl, thanks for working so hard with me and for helping me to be a better ball player. I would also like to thank all my teammates, with some of them that are in the audience today. Thank you for inspiring me, making the game more fun and enjoyable. A lot of great memories that I will never forget. After two and a half years in the minor leagues, being groomed as a catcher, I began my rookie season in the major leagues in 1975. The Expo started me in the outfield. Well, that was when I had, uh, could run pretty good and had some pretty decent knees. But uh, after having a pretty good first half, I was invited to the All-Star Game in Milwaukee. Well, there it was Johnny Bench who befriended me and kind of took me under his wing. By then, Johnny had established himself as one of, if not, the greatest catcher of all time. He had already won two MVP awards and had developed the one-handed style of catching, as, uh, and also as one of the best defensive catchers there ever was. Maybe, just maybe, he saw a little of him in me. We had a picture taken together, and later I asked him if he would sign it for me. And he wrote on it, he said, kid, in a few years, it's all yours. Well, that inspired me to carry the torch for catchers, because it made me want to work hard as possible and to try to make every all-star game and be the best at my, my, my position. Thanks, JB. I appreciate it very much. I was sitting there talking to Eddie, and he says, well, you're the one that chose those tools of uh, ignorance, but really, I always consider them being the tools of excellence. And there's something special I truly feel about being a catcher that only another catcher can understand. So Yogi, Pudge, JB, you know what I'm talking about. It's an honor to enjoy being a part of this great fraternity. Well, after two and a half years playing mostly in the outfield, I finally got a chance to play every day behind the plate in 1977. Dick Williams was instrumental in making that happen. From that, on, that point on, the rest is history. You see, going to a baseball game, just like you guys are here today, and sitting in the stands is like going to that happy place where you can leave your worries behind. One of my favorite lines comes from a movie, Field of Dreams, and it goes something like this. This game, this great game, is as innocent as children longing for the past. The feeling you get when you go to a ball game, walking through the aisles to your seats, sitting in your sh shirt sleeves on a perfect afternoon. You find your reserve seats somewhere along the baselines and acting if you were a kid again. It's almost as if, though, you were dipped yourself in magical waters that the memories will be so thick you have to brush them away from your faces. Yes, the one constant through all the years has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been a race like a blackboard, built and erased again. But baseball has marked the time, America's pastime. Baseball has allowed me to meet so many special people along the way. One here today that I am so honored to have in our presence is former President George Bush Sr.
He has been such a great friend through the years, and I appreciate very much the effort of you coming to today's ceremony with your grandson, Robert. And uh, I just want to thank you from uh, the bottom of my heart, Mr. President. God bless you. A few more people who kept me on track, especially in the business side of uh, baseball, were Dick Moss and Matt Marola. They couldn't be here today, but thank you guys for helping me with all the contracts and, and endorsements through the years. I'd also like to especially thank one particular good friend, and that's Jerry Petrie, who not only was instrumental and was such a great guy and became such a good friend in Montreal, but he also was my agent. He re represented me in all aspects as an agent, and I appreciated the guidance and direction that he gave me. He encouraged me to be accommodating to the press, the fans, and made sure I always looked my best. Pete, thanks for everything. I also want to extend a very special thank you to my good friend, Mee Chasky. I have known this man for a long time when he was a huge fan and would hang around the team bus and get autographs from all the players. <laughs> Tell you what, he's, he's now my manager and he's been the best man for this job to handle so many things for me. You're awesome, Mead, and I can't thank you enough. What a God's name you've been. The greatest thrill of my career certainly was that amazing 86 World Series. Nothing will ever top that, and the memories will last forever. All of you that were there, everybody will remember the dramatic Game 6, and certainly the way we came back in that series. So all you Mets fans out there, God bless you, 86. I will be forever grateful to the Expos for beginning my career and winding up my career in 1992. The Lord gave me a storybook ending of my career in front of over 40,000 fans. My last at bat was a game-winning double, and after hobbling to second base, I left the game to a standing ovation. There is nothing like the roar of the crowd. Now I'd like to take this moment to say what an honor it is to share this date with you, Eddie. Even though we only shared one year together with the Dodgers, I always respected your desire and your professionalism. A lot of people don't know Eddie Murray the way I do, and it was in spring training in 1991. After one of the games, Eddie headed back to the clubhouse with a bat that he had broken in a game. In the midst of a large crowd, Eddie handed that broken bat to a smiling little boy. That boy happened to be my son, DJ. <laughs> he was only six years old at the time, and he ran into the clubhouse to show me what he had just gotten. I was kind of shocked because, Eddie, I mean, you don't share a lot of things with a lot of people, you know? <laughs> But anyway, I walked over to him and asked him if he would kindly sign it, and after a brief hesitation, he did. And, uh, well, today, DJ considers that bat one of his most prized possessions. And that, right there, was the start of the Carter-Murray connection. Who would have believed that we would be standing here today, on July 27, 2003, being inducted with all these great players? Thank you, from the bottom of my heart. It is nice to know that even though my body feels like an old man now, I will always be a kid at heart. I love this great game. I'm so honored to be in Cooperstown as a Hall of Famer. I love you all. God bless you. Thank you very much.